one. Tim, how many people are in here? It looks like we have 14, including um, you and I. Okay, so a couple more minutes. Okay, true or false, ADHD is not recognized as a real medical condition. Looks like we're pretty split on that question, but the correct answer is false. So according to both the CDC and the American Psychiatric Association, ADHD is recognized as a real medical condition. And um, there are imaging studies out there that show um, that there are differences in the brain for people with ADHD. And this shows that <clears throat> there's activity missing in a certain part of the brain that you need to focus. So next question, true or false, people with ADHD can try harder to pay attention. Correct answer is false. Um, often people with ADHD are trying as hard as they can to pay attention, they just can't. So it's not a lack of motivation and it's not laziness as some people think, it's just there's something missing in their brain that makes it hard for them to pay attention. Next one, sometimes with people with ADHD can focus without meds. That is true. So one of the things that I love about ADHD is that people with ADHD like me have the ability to hyper-focus on things that they like. So when you see like a kid that can't stop playing his video game, or if you're at work and you're working on a part of your job that you like, but then your boss comes by and says, just kidding, I want you to do this. You're just like, ah, ah. like that's the hyper-focus. And, um, for me, um, one of my personal experiences in studio when I was getting my Master of Architecture is I expected to have three straight hours to work on my project. And then our studio professor would come in and say, okay guys, we're gonna have a little 20 minute lecture right now. And my brain would have a hard time shutting down and like switching gears. And so that's one of the things that people with ADHD have to deal with. Only boys can be officially diagnosed with ADHD. This one's an easy one. <laughs> so that is false. Boys are twice as likely to be diagnosed, but that's because for girls and women, sometimes the symptoms are overlooked because they present themselves differently than in boys. So. They say that girls are more daydreamy when they have ADHD. So they're not actually like running around, jumping off the walls, but they're still staring out the window, having a hard time focusing. And people don't realize that that is a symptom of ADHD. ADHD is a learning disability. You guys are all on the same page. <laughs> However, that's false. It is not a learning disability. 
the symptoms get in the way of learning, but it's not officially a learning disability. But people with ADHD can still look for support in school or work. It still can fall under necessary accommodations if you need them. And um, I'll talk more about, actually, I'll talk about that now. So for example, for me, when I found out that I had ADHD while I was in grad school, I asked my professors to give me clearer deadlines because if they said like, oh, just get this done when you can, that didn't work for me because I usually work right up to the deadline. And also I had to let that studio professor I mentioned know that if we were gonna lose studio time to do lectures that he had to let me know in advance so I didn't get caught up in something because it was really hard for me to switch gears. All right, last one, which some of you have already answered. I'll give a couple more minutes for people that didn't. Some kids can outgrow their ADHD as they get older. That is false. Unfortunately, you can't cure ADHD. It's there forever. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> okay, back to my presentation. So what exactly is ADHD? It stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder and it affects 8.4% of children and 2.5% of adults. However, um, this study was taken in 2009 and it's 2022, a lot of time has passed, a lot of people have gotten diagnosed. This number could be a lot higher now. There are three different types, the inattentive type, the hyperactive impulsive type, ooh, typo, and the combined type. And I'll talk about the different symptoms in my next slide, but I wanted to say that um, it's, for people that have anxiety and depression, these are um, caused by ADHD that's gone undiagnosed sometimes. So a lot of people find out they have it as an adult because they're going to therapy to figure out why they're depressed and why they're anxious. And it turns out that they're anxious because they are worried that they can't meet a deadline or they're depressed because they keep forgetting stuff and they keep messing up at work and they don't realize that it's because of the ADHD. So the two different types, the inattentive type is lack of attention to detail, making careless mistakes, struggling to focus in lectures, conversations, or while doing a long reading. They seem to be somewhere else when someone's talking to them. They don't follow through on tasks or instructions, have problem organizing tasks, avoid tasks that they don't like, the ones that take a lot of thinking, lose things needed for daily life, like their keys or their wallet. For example, I have a tile, the um, tracker on my wallet because I lose it about once a month <laughs> and they're easily distracted or they forget to do chores or run errands. Whereas the hyperactive, hyperactive impulsive type is fidgeting, tapping, squirming. For example, I rock in my chair all the time, um, not able to stay seated, running around when it's inappropriate. That's more for kids, I guess. Um, unable to play quietly, always on the go, talks too much, blurts out answers before questions finished, finishing other people's sentences, cutting people off in conversation, and difficulty waiting their turn. And the combined type is what it is. Um, it combines these two together. And one thing that I like to mention is that ADHD is a spectrum. So you may not have all of these symptoms. You may only have a couple. You may have a few on each side of the list, but that doesn't mean that you don't have ADHD. It just means that your version is different than someone else's. It's not a one size fits all type of disorder. So what are the treatment options? Uh, therapy, 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 therapy. You can take as many meds as you want, but if you don't do therapy with that, it will only do so much. So that's why you have to go see a psychiatrist to get diagnosed and go through those steps because it's really important to learn what your um, mental hacks are. So you learn what your disorder symptoms are and then you learn how to work around them. Um, but if you do take meds, they are helpful. 
And my psychiatrist told me that um, I shouldn't try to live without my meds. I shouldn't have a plan to like one day be done with them because like I said before, you can't cure ADHD. You're always gonna have it. And so he compared it to someone with like a heart disease. Like you have to take your meds for your heart. You don't plan to stop taking your meds for your heart or you can't live your life without your glasses if you can't see. So um, there are three hormones in the brain that people with ADHD are deficient in, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And so sometimes you have to take three meds to account for all three of those deficits. So for norepinephrine, let's see if I get this right. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm not going to say which is which, but there's Adderall, Zepro, and Stratera, and those three together fix all those um, deficits. So I'll make this part quick. Um, I'm just going to explain how I found out that I have ADHD at the age of 25. So as a kid, I was great in school. I got really good grades. Undergrad, I graduated magna cum laude. I got honor roll in high school. So no one thought that I had ADHD, but it was very clear looking back. For example, in class, I couldn't pay attention. I had to take notes, I had to doodle, I had to do something with my hands in order to get my brain to focus on what the teacher was saying. And I would get in trouble for doodling. And I couldn't explain to my teachers that I needed to doodle in order to listen. Like I was listening because I was doodling, but I couldn't explain it because I didn't know that I had it. Or my teachers would get mad because I wasn't looking them in the eye as they were talking, like I was looking around. But again, I couldn't explain that that doesn't mean I'm not listening. Like I'm still listening. It's just my brain works differently. And so back in 2000, I don't know, 17-ish, I was dating someone that had ADHD, officially diagnosed with it. And he would take his meds every day. He would go to therapy every day. And I started to notice that we had a lot of the same things in common. And he kept pushing me, go to therapy, go to therapy, go to therapy. So I finally did. And the first thing I learned was that impulsive, impulsivity was one of the symptoms. And that's when I knew, like it explained everything. I am the most impulsive, impulsive person in the world. Like I just do whatever comes to mind. And I would get depressed because I would do something without thinking. And then I'd have to deal with the um, results of that action. And then I'd be depressed. And that's what led me to therapy. And so um, before I got officially diagnosed, I was just talking with my, my therapist about some of these things. And she was teaching me all these different mechanisms to like um, work through my symptoms. And eventually she referred me to a psychiatrist and I got diagnosed. And so the process of getting diagnosed, you have to talk to a psychiatrist. You have to take all these questionnaires that ask you like, do you do this? Do you do this? Is it hard for you to do this? And then you have to um, have someone else take that test for you, someone that's really close to you because it has to be um, confirmed by someone else. So I had my mom go through this with me. And every time I would read out a symptom, she would say, that's not ADHD, I do that too. And I was like, no mom, you have it too. <laughs> and it is hereditary. So typically if someone's diagnosed, there's someone else in the family that has it. So the more I learned about it, the more I wish I knew sooner, but um, it definitely came in handy um, in grad school because I was getting to the point where I was really struggling because my old job, when I worked retail, I was on my feet all day. I was talking to people all day. Every day was different. And then switching to architecture, having to sit at a computer all day, it was really hard for me. So I'll give a couple examples um, of the power of Adderall. So we were doing a summer class for um, learning MEPS, mechanical, electrical, all that stuff. And we had a project where we had to design the mechanical, sy sy mechanical systems for a building. And I didn't understand how to use Revit, not one bit. And it was really confusing. I would sit down to do it and I'd look at the screen and then I would stop. And I did this for 10 minutes a day for a week. And then when I took Adderall, I sat down, two hours, finished the project. And it was so 
awesome. I was like, I can't believe that I focused this long. Like it blew my mind. And then another example, when I was interning at the same time um, at work, I would be on my computer drafting for 30 minutes and then I get distracted by my phone for two minutes. And then I go back to drafting for 30 minutes. Then I get up and go get coffee. And then I come back and then I get on my phone. I couldn't focus. But after I started taking Adderall, I could sit down and draft for eight hours straight without having to get up. But there are downsides to Adderall. You lose your appetite, which sucks because I love food. Um, you're extremely thirsty all the time. And you get a little crabby when the meds start to wear off at the end of the day. So ADHD in college. So let's talk design classes versus regular classes. So, and I'm not gonna say that regular classes, you're going to struggle to focus if you have ADHD. It's more so classes that you're not interested in. So for me, I like classes that are more, um, what's the word, regulated classes with like very clear deadlines, very clear instructions, very clear assignments. So if I have to read a chapter and answer questions and write down definitions, like that's really easy for me. Whereas design classes are more free flowing and you get this deadline that's way out in the future and then you have to figure out how to um, manage your time. So those are harder for me. But um, for some people, they struggle to focus in classes that are lectures. But um, the advice is to make the class relevant. You have to make it interesting. You have to make it affect you personally, and then you can work through it. So for me, um, accounting was a hard one because it's accounting. <laughs> and so the way that I made that interesting is I would put it to running my business in the future. Like, okay, let's pretend like this is my store and I have to do this for work in order to manage my business. And then that helped me make it relevant and it helped me focus more. Some other things that you can do um, if you're in a lecture that's boring you like this one, <laughs> um, doodling, taking notes, fidget spinners, poppets, those things are there to um, get part of your brain working on something so that the other part can focus. So I always have to multitask. I have um, mindless games on my phone that I play when I wanna pay attention to something. And um, taking notes is another good way because it helps you remember what's being said and it puts an action to it. So um, another thing for like design classes, how to deal with um, the deadlines that are way out in, the, in space and trying to make them easier to follow is to create your own deadlines. So if you know that your projects do two months in the future, like give yourself a deadline two weeks from now that says, okay, I'm gonna be done with this part. And then two weeks after that, I'll be done with this part and make yourself stick to it. And another thing you can do is find a mentor that understands how your brain works. So for me, I had a teacher named Vince that he understood exactly what I was going through. He was an architect. He could tell me like, okay, if you do it this way, it'll work better. And that's the only reason I made it this far. Um, so if anyone on this call has ADHD and they wanna to continue to talk to someone that understands, I have my email on my last slide. So re reach out to me if you wanna discuss. So we'll go to the Q&A, but I'll start with some questions that Kim sent me before. So first, what would it look like to desi design a space for people with ADHD? So I'm gonna answer this with a joke. <laughs> How would you design a preschool? like a preschool for adults basically. And I'm not really kidding. So you know how like in a nursery um, babies, you put a mobile above them that spins around so they can watch it spin. What would an adult mobile look like? Something that's moving so you can watch it while you're listening. Um, lots of windows so that you can see what's going on outside. Uh, swivel chairs for people that need to fidget like me. Um, maybe each room in a school has different colors or a different theme so that every classroom doesn't look the same and you feel like you're in the same place every time you switch rooms. Um, looking into the acoustics, uh, 
sounds like HVAC, clocks ticking, doors opening and closing, those sounds are distracting. So making sure that the rooms are very acoustically sealed so there's no distracting noises. And like for me, when I was in studio, we had a classmate that would whistle <laughs> and it drove me crazy. And so I don't know how you can design for that. <laughs> um, lots of TVs, um, they say that it causes ADHD, but it's good for focusing your energy. For example, um, I have a dentist that would let you watch Netflix while you're getting your teeth cleaned. Like, I don't know why more dentists don't do that. Um, what would a mind spa look like for people with ADHD? So some elements of the previous answer, but like I said, basically a preschool for adults. Um, lots of games, interactive elements, things that challenge the mind and create opportunities to hyperfocus or somewhere that you can shut your brain down. Like, what are those things called? The, the chambers where you're like underwater and they shut off all your senses, something like that. Um, no appointments, no deadlines. You just come and go when you want. So it would have to be open 24 hours because people with ADHD don't like to be restricted. So no closing time. And then what does it mean to be neurodivergent? Basically, it's someone that thinks differently than the neurotypical. Um, so one question I have is if most of society identifies themselves as neurodiverse, does that make it the new neurotypical? It's a very philosophical question, but um, people, I, my mission in life is to help society change the way that they see mental disorders because um, people think that mental disorders need to be changed all the time. But with something like ADHD, it's more of a gift instead of a curse. And as long as you're able to function and do your job and stay healthy and not hurt anyone and you can think and process information, then there's no reason to change that. Just do what works for you. And that's basically what I have. So thank you for listening and I will open it up to questions now. I actually, I have a question just to get us started here. You mentioned working retail and designing end caps and um, kind of adding that onto your job. So it got me thinking about merchandising and a lot of designers end up specifying in merchandising or retail design and having to think about psychology of shoppers is, is there, um, like if we're thinking about grabbing the attention of a shopper as a, like a merchandiser or retailer, do you have any suggestions on how to design for that? So whenever people asked what my job was, when I worked at Target, I said, you know how you go in Target for one thing and you leave with a million other things. My job is to make you do that. So we would change up the end caps probably once a week for target corporate standards, but I was able to change them depending on what I thought would work better. Like there were some that had to stay, but I had the um, freedom to change it to anything. So what we did was we would pay attention to what was happening in the local community and we would put things that were relevant. So if it was close to the 4th of July, we would have the swimsuits up at front. And, or for example, um, if it was Oberon season, Oberon just came out, we would have oranges and beer sitting up front. Um, that is the simplest way to catch attention is to put what you know people are looking for or something that you know will like make them wanna buy it. But more advanced is um, the colors, the uh, interactive exhibits, those things help. Um, I went to a store once that had an iPad by the food and you could pick recipes off the iPad and then it would show you where the ingredients were in the store, which was really cool. Um, but one of the other things that I had to do was make sure that the shelves were full and everything was pulled forward to the front of the shelf. So it seemed like a whole wall of product. And 
things like that catch people's eye. It makes them want to go to that and see what's on that shelf. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the thinking about the frequency, like designing a space that can be changed frequently. Um, you know, if you're if you're designing the overall space as opposed to the um, the fixtures, designing something where those fixtures can be rearranged, re um, changed, where the wall can be changed up easy is really interesting. Yeah, when I was at two jobs ago, I was working for. Um, GFS, designing GFS stores, we were doing remodels. And it was really easy to rearrange the store because it was basically just the shell of the building and then it was just the fixtures that moved around. So it was really easy to move fixtures around when they were ready to change it up. So when you're designing for retail, at least, you don't wanna to put too many walls. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how some of those merchandising tips and also, you know, creating an experience that's maybe different every time somebody comes to engage them, how that could be transferred to um, other program types like yeah. office design or, or school just, um, but it made me think about you talking um, on the transition between like focusing on a project and then having to divert your attention, even if it's just for 20 minutes, <laughs> which probably ruined the whole day after that. <laughs> um, how, you know, what are some tips for students and teachers? Um, you know, are there, are there transitions that can maybe help from your experience? Um, because those are inevitable in school and not. And then also um, a lot of the things that you know I'm thinking of I do during class too and maybe not even give as clear of direction um do you have tips for teachers who are you know essentially teaching adults um you know basically it's what you said just clearer deadlines um some teachers like the way their brain works it's easy for them to just switch gears and um, like something comes up and you're like, oh, well, let's do this instead. But instead of doing that, maybe save that for the next class and say, okay, that was a good idea. Let me write that down. We'll do that next time. But um, just make sure that the classes are really organized, really planned in advance so that the student knows what they're going to, the student knows what's going to happen when they come to class each day. And it's not a surprise. Um, but at the same time, like, we can't make the world change for us. Like, still, when it comes down to it, we have to control our own symptoms. And if a teacher does say, okay, we're going to switch gears, then I have to switch gears. And it's up to me to figure out how to make that work. And it's different for everyone. So I can only say what I do, which is um, mentally cry in my head. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just you have to learn how to make it work. Yeah, and I imagine for as hard as, some, you know, if you're in a class as a student, as sometimes it's hard to focus. Um, but I imagine that then when you go home or you're in a different environment, you also find that it's hard to stop thinking about, you know, a project. So you're constantly engaged in, a discussion that happened or an idea that you get an, a studio project idea, but you can't um, separate yourself appropriately from that. Has that ever happened? Is that a part of it? Um, and how do you, how do you find ways to separate? <laughs> it's hard to answer that because when I was in grad school, I was constantly working on my project. Like there was no separation. <laughs> like I would go to studio, work on the project, go home, work on the project. There was, there were no breaks. So I never had that issue of needing to separate because I just expected to be working on it all the time. But now that I'm working, I, I shut off when I leave the office, like I leave it all at work. And that works for me because I take my meds to get me through the workday. And then once I'm home, like I'm home. 
So I know that I'm not even going to be able to function on the project until I get back at work the next day. So I write myself a list before I leave the office. And then when I come back, I know where I left off and I just pick up where I left off. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody um, have questions for Jade about ADHD, experiencing ADHD or design related? <laughs> it's a topic that we're going to be talking about in um uh psychology and philosophy class next week and the idea of um being neurodiverse versus like neurotypical and um what those even are and and um ADHD is essentially one of many different um unseen <laughs> conditions that people have but one thing I did, and you um, posed this in one of your questions, is it a learning disability? So is, but it has the word disorder, you know, it's the D. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, you know, what it, to you, what is the difference between a disorder and a disability, if there is one? So I'm no expert, let me preface that, but, um, I don't think there is a difference because I refer to my ADHD as a disability sometimes because sometimes it gets in the way of me being able to do something. So I think that um, the word disability is just vague, vague at this point. So um, whereas disorder, that's the official term for the disorder. So I think that's the only difference that disability is more what you think it is like if something's getting in the way of you being able to do something that makes a disability whereas a disorder is official terminology gotcha and i see you just posted your email address in the chat and um you've had such a good mentor that you, you even said you wouldn't even be here today <laughs> and where you are today i shouldn't say that in um where you are in life today without having a mentor who understands um, and has also experienced those things. So, um, if anybody here or, you know, watching this, um, in a recording, um, is experiencing that, um, Jade did provide her email address in the chat box. Um, and this will actually get posted unlisted to YouTube for some students to watch. I will also put the email address in the description box um, in the event that the chat box doesn't show up in the recording. Um, but yeah, well, I'll give, I'll give another minute for, for anybody that has questions. Okay. I do know that um, talking about ADHD is personal to some people. So there are people that may have questions that they don't wanna ask on here. Again, you can email me those questions. I do see a hand being raised. <laughs> Sophia. Hi, um, yes. I was wondering if you could talk about your experience in an office setting. So let's see. Random noises are very distracting, but unavoidable. Um, so like if someone's coughing constantly or there's like a ticking noise coming from above, it's super distracting. So I put on headphones. Um, some people like to listen to music. I like to watch TV. So I have three screens at work on one screen. I'll be watching Netflix and then I'll be drafting in another. Um, Swivel chairs, again, are very important. I fidget a lot. Um, having something to do with my hands while I'm waiting for Revit to load. So like, um, again, I have the game on my phone that like if I have two seconds while waiting for something to load, I just quickly like play a couple and then go on from there. Um, but I do want to say that if there's anything that's bothering you, if you're at work and it's getting in the way of you focusing, don't be afraid to say something to HR because even though it's not called a disability, it is. 
And so you are able to get accommodations for that. Um, but like I said, I know it's really private and some people don't want to admit that they have it because there's still like the negative connotation. Like if you say you have it, then they're going to be like, well, why did I hire her? Like she can't focus. So um, you just have to be really clear about what you need from the office setting. So if someone next to you makes too much noise, asks to be moved or asks to be able to work from home or something like that. Thank you. You're welcome. You've you've brought up noise a few times, which is really interesting. What about um, light? How does like light levels or even being near a window do those? Does that negatively, you know, impact? Or is a window considered kind of like a screen? Maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> um, how does that impact you? Or I don't think it does. Okay. <laughs> Well, right. <laughs> if the lighting is like flickering, like I think that will affect anybody. <laughs> or um, if I'm doing something and I have a glare, that would be distracting. But again, like, I don't know if that's particular to ADHD or just things that people notice. It's a very blurred line. It could have a, a greater impact maybe, or a <laughs> longer term impact. Um, on people with different um, differences. Yeah. All right. That was a great question. Thanks, Sophia. All right. And then I see a comment in the chat. This was great. Didn't think of my own behavior until you made some points. Nice. Yeah, so I, that's I, what happens is that we go our whole lives and we don't even realize that we may have it. So if any of this resonated with you, just take the test, find out. What is the test? Is that something that you have to see a doctor for um, or like yes. a mental health professional or, okay. You'll need a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But usually if someone does the testing, it's um, on their website, it says ADHD testing, and then you know. And um, being that we are at a big university, Western does have those services for students for free. Um, we have a whole health center, so. Um, the reason I asked about the mind spot is because Western is working on something um, called a mind spa. It started during, you know, the project kind of started during COVID and it hasn't really picked up again yet, but it will um, for students who need to escape from school and campus, but they live there. Um, so how do you, you know, completely separate that? So thank you for oh. speaking on that because so, you know, the things that you mentioned would be useful on a mind spa um, could also impact somebody else differently, um, maybe with a different disorder or, you know, completely differently. So um, hard to balance, balance some of those things. Definitely yeah. a, a large area of research needs big hole in, <laughs> in research here. Definitely need a doctor on board. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.